to show me the library. Right. And to show me some of the uh, books that you couldn't get in the library mm. in the town, which were written by Masonic historians uh, and uh, authors that had just written about general things through the history that weren't really around openly. Mm, interesting. Um, so do you, do you think they, at that point, uh, you know, <laughs> withheld some information from you because you weren't uh, willing to to uh, join, as it were? Um, no, I don't think so, actually. I think that, in a way, because I was so open and centered within myself, that they kind of sensed that I wouldn't be the right sort of person for the lodge anyway. Mm. Um, after speaking with them for a bit, um, yeah, I, they, I think they definitely got the impression that I wasn't very fond of Freemasonry, but, but I was more interested than I was judgmental. Yeah, exactly. I'm, I, I definitely think that they, that they understood that. Hmm. But, I mean, that's an interesting point you, you raised there too, because uh, that that implies, so to speak, that you're you're thinking that Freemasonry is is uh, which it is obviously when you, when you think about the concept of it. But what you're saying here is that this is something that is more, uh, it's it's a collective type of uh, or organization, which means that you hand yourself over to something which you as an individual don't have full control of. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, from, from every facet of it, really. I mean, wearing a uniform, you know, very much like school or the army or some sort of state provision. Yeah. Even the politician in his suit, you know, hmm. any of these kind of roles where they give you a uniform, tell you ways to act, ways to move, even, you know, hmm. just to walk. <laughs> hmm. You know, when you see the uh, Masonic kind of marches, like the uh, the Orange marches around Northern Ireland, mm -hmm. um, or if you see them going to large meetings at Great Great Queen Street. Uh, you'll see them walking in this kind of military file, <laughs> all swinging their arms at the same pace. Right. Kind of, uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, every aspect of it, in my mind, um, is, is about control. Yeah. Um, and, you know, as, as most people that have looked into this, you, know, you find the work of Albert Pike. Um, and, you know, I think he sums it up brilliantly when he talks about the concept of hoodwinking. Yeah. You know, admittance. Yeah. Um, and so you just get them always wanting the next degree, wanting the next aspect of it, you know. So it's very much kind of like a drug fiend, <laughs> but instead of a, a substance, they're, they're offering you mystery. Yeah. You know? hmm. So they're kind of trying to get you hooked before you know what it is. Yeah. And And also, I mean, what about the idea that you're, when you're going into it, you don't know what, it is that you are signing up for, meaning that since you can't, okay, I mean, there are many books that are detailing uh, the, the, you know, the initiation, uh, what is happening and so forth, but but still to some some extent, uh, we don't really know, you know, what actually is going on within some lodges or how the, you know, how, I mean, they could, for, for what we know, I mean, they could even change some rituals right now because a lot of the information has been coming out, you know what I'm yeah. saying, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, We've had uh, recently, we've had this uh, quite famous occultist in his field, uh, Alan T. Greenfield. Yeah. He's been on a, a cult of personality and uh, he's, uh, he's been releasing a lot of books since he's left, as he would call it, his certain organization. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what he talks about um, in one of his books is it's called The Secret Cipher of the Euphenauts. Um, and Jay Kotze and others have also talked about it. Uh, it's a certain page of Alistair Crowley's Book of the Law, mm. um, which you can gain a cipher from it if you draw a grid over it. Uh, there's a certain ratio that you put the grid over this page of writing, and you can actually obtain a cipher from it. Mm. Um, and Bishop Greenfield, as he likes to be called, <laughs> has uh, noted that if you take a lot of the names of different rituals or deities or even the passwords of various mystery schools and certain degrees within Freemasonry and apply them to the cipher, you get some very interesting output. Hmm. You get references to older gods and very different gods than you think you're talking about. 
Right. So, I mean, this is just one kind of modern source who's kind of proving in a, in a roundabout way that the more of these rituals that you learn off by heart, kind of like a stage actor, you know, mm -hmm. um, that you're inputting yourself with huge ceremonies of ritual and magic, which you don't understand, mm -hmm. which do have a specific purpose, but you don't know what they are. And you most probably never will within the Freemasonic societies unless you have the impetus to look and find out about it yourself. Hmm. And even at that point, there's so much kind of circumbobulation, so much tossing and turning and umming and ahhing between this and that, yeah. that even after 40 or 50 years of studying it, you know, most people, even such as Manly P. Hall, he'll, he'll give you hours of conversation on Freemasonry, but if hmm. you asked him the the blank question, what is it and what does it do? Mm. I think he'd um and ah again a little bit more. <laughs> you know, I mean, and this is a guy who'd been through a lot of the rituals, obviously was given degrees honorarily, so he didn't have to do certain degree rituals. Mm -hmm. But, you know, he was one of the sort of the most mavericks, talkers and writers on the subject of Freemasonry. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think that he fully understood it. Hmm. So it's, uh, yeah, exactly. And I mean, uh, Pike talks about it too, of course, in his Morals and Dogma, that uh, uh, there are all the different kinds of level and, and uh, the game, as it were, is always to let uh, the, the, the apprentice or, or, you know, if you advance up through the degrees that you're, you're supposed to think that you have attained the highest level and the, and the greatest secrets, as it were, but once you advance one level more, there's always a new name that's given to you, a new ritual, a new, you know, whatever, basically. Yeah, yeah. So each time you're, you're getting told, hey, you know all that mystical, spiritual, deep stuff that you learned before? None of that's true. <laughs> this is the true stuff now. Yeah. This is what you've got to drum into your head until that's all you can think about. Well, I mean... The, and then when you've done that, then you can move up, you know. That's actually a, fine, a, a kind of trauma in a way. Uh, Absolutely. I mean, you yeah. might have spent even years at, at, at some... Uh, level or at one degree and then, then you end up finding out that you know, it's all bollocks what you've been told and you've been so into it, you know, so I mean, sheesh, I wonder what what it actually does to to the mind of a person who's really you know, 100% focused and dedicated to, to this kind of organization just to find out that you've been, you know, <laughs> basically fooled all the time, that's yeah. not a good sign for to me at least you know, <laughs> absolutely hmm. absolutely so, um this is very interesting, and this is, this is definitely worth, you know, thinking about. And uh, uh, it's interesting also that you mentioned that that the the guys that you talk to in the in this lodge then kind of looked at you in this way that they, <laughs> to some to some extent, uh, you could see some regret almost in their eyes, you know. Mm, absolutely. Hmm. I mean, it's it's an age-old theme which is brought out in every other film that comes out. It's kind of you know the the manager or the worker who who regrets not having spent more time with his family, you know? Yeah. Who regrets not having spent more time out with his dog walking, things like that, you know? Yeah. Regrets having spent lots of time with a load of blokes that don't really like you, you know? <laughs> uh, going through sort of rituals you don't understand uh, to try and get a little bit more sway in the business world or yeah. to try and give you a bit more sway on a kind of individual will-based manifest level, you know? Yeah. Hmm. So, um, uh, what do you think, Daniel? Should we move into and talk a little bit about um, uh, Bath, a little bit, uh, you know, some of the the, the overarching, uh, interesting, I mean, we could go into either architecture or some of the uh, surface history, as it were. Um, is it a good bridge between Freemasonry and, and diving into the city of Bath? Yeah, absolutely. I mean... At present, there's seven lodges that meet in Bath um, in seven different halls. Um, but there's also about six other groups which are kind of, they're referenced by the lodges as attending meetings there on their own nights. Um, but there's still, there's not really much knowledge about who these groups are. Um, personally, I think that one of them is the, uh, the Eastern Star. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm not quite sure why it's uh, it 
that's not talked about in Bath, but there's a, a very large gallery called the Victoria Gallery. Um, and it's connected to the town hall. Um, and it's, uh, it's a very nice gallery. <laughs> mm. It has every month, it will have uh, free exhibitions, some very good artists from around the world. Um, and there's also always a, a main room near the top, a large rectangular red room, <laughs> mm. which uh, is full of uh, famous paintings uh, by people like Thomas Gainsborough. Um, he's a very famous landscape and portrait painter. Mm. Uh, kind of contemporary Georgian painter. Um, and this, the whole gallery was actually paid for and dedicated to Queen Victoria during her reign. Mm. By, and it says this on a plaque, by the women of Bath. Mm. Um, and, you know, I don't know how much clout the women of Bath have now, let alone in Georgian times. Yeah. But there are certain women that have more clout. You know, they're the women that are the the wives of the Freemasons, yeah, who right. are in their own fraternal orders because they're so bored. Yeah, and and I mean, you you mentioned the 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 Eastern Star, and and as you know, what we know about that right now is that both that's the lodge that both uh, men and women can join. You know, um, I think yeah, there's some which do allow men to join. I, I think more it's they call it co-op. Freemasonry, uh-huh, yeah. uh, which is the one for both, and I think the Eastern Star maybe in recent years they've had to change some of their admissions, but it was almost always uh, privately, you know, and purely for the ladies. Right, right. But that may have changed in previous uh, in, in 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 the years around now because uh, you know the, the the average age of the Masons in each lodge, you know, is sort of in the seventies. <laughs> right. Um, and and their numbers are dying off faster than they're growing. Uh, well, exactly, and that's a good point, because there's, uh, I believe, in a way, constant uh, reformation, as it were, of, of, I mean, we can see it in religion, and we can definitely see it within, uh, you know, uh, fraternal organizations as well, because if their main interest is to to stay alive and, uh, and you know, have new new people joining, they need to constantly revamp themselves, because just as you say, I mean, the uh, many orders... Or kind of you, you can see these uh, articles, you know, uh, popping out so many times in different newspapers. If you do like a, a news Google search on Freemason or whatever, it's basically these um, recruiting articles, as it were. You know, they even giving yeah. you the the lodge, you know, telephone number to call at the end of the article. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so yeah. yeah, yeah. I think that it's definitely, and this is part of the kind of the veil which has been brought up, and it, and it's almost kind of a mistaken veil because. I think if researchers were looking into it better, as we know, the average lodge ages of, you know, established lodges is very old. Mm-hmm. But what you're referencing and what researchers haven't talked about so much because they just want Freemasonry to go away is that there are a lot of new lodges and new groups being set up all the time, mm-hmm. specifically by younger people, four groups of younger people. Mm-hmm. And this is very much a part of this whole propaganda campaign which has come through with these films through Disney, um, various books from various authors, you know, all just piquing the interest in these orders. Mm. Um, and, yeah, this is, it's a big aspect which is only now starting to be picked up on. Um, and for a while, uh, people thought that massively the numbers were going down, but they are within the established lodges which have the older memberships. Yeah. Whereas, as you said, it seems to be a kind of resurgence amongst, you know, the people. It's almost like a dichotomy that's been set up. You have all of these people that, from 9-11 and from that kind of period, have kind of shifted to the more anti-the state, anti-the government, anti-military intelligence Mm. whole, you know, Mm. network. And then you get the people that kind of say, all of those people are crazy and, and skittish and everything. And a lot of these time, these are the people that are, the managers and are the, the people in positions of authority, you know. Mm. Um, I know that from having worked at places and talked about these subjects with people in the staff rooms, often the managers who become this kind of father paternal Zeus-like figure over all of the employees <laughs> right. um, are, are very sort of damning of any of this stuff. Yeah. 